Hello, everyone. My name is Jerry Zachs, and I am a second generation Holocaust survivor. And what that means is that my father, Saul Zachs, and my mother, Berta Zachs, they survived numerous concentration camps and uh, labor camps. My father actually also endured three death marches. Back in 1980, I interviewed my parents and I have two hours of audio recordings about their experiences. But only about three and a half, four years ago when I retired, did I transcribe those uh, audio recordings and I realized I had a lot of interesting facts, but I didn't have the threads that tied the story together. I've spent the last three and a half years researching my parents' uh, history uh, them growing up in Poland, uh, how they uh, entered the concentration camps, how they survived the concentration camps, and how after they were liberated, they rebuilt their lives and emigrated to the United States. And I'd like to share their story with you today. However, before we actually get started, I'd like everybody to reflect on what they think of when they hear the word Holocaust. Uh, what does it mean to you? What first comes to mind? <clears throat> to many people, you hear the word Holocaust and numbers come to mind. Six million Jews murdered, 20 death camps and concentration camps. Um, the, to many other people, the first thing that comes to mind is the names of death and concentration camps. Names like Treblinka, Auschwitz-Birkenau, and Dachau come to mind. Other people, when they hear the word Holocaust, they think of images, images of people being boarded onto cattle car box trains, uh, images of adults and children having stars of David sewn onto their outer clothing. And another thing that comes to some people's mind is Nazi Germany's propaganda machine. Um, posters like the one you see in the lower right-hand corner, blaming Jews for World War I, and of course, the infamous uh, message of the final solution that Nazi Germany proclaimed. All these uh, thoughts and concepts are sound and they are certainly very legitimate, but I implore you to think of one other thing. When you hear the word Holocaust, it's about blind and unjustified hate, pure hate, hate of race, hate of religion, hate of people that simply do not think like you. When you hear the word Holocaust, you should think about the families also and the people, the stories of people, how families were torn apart and destroyed and how people's lives were lost, how people's lives were impacted. And in some miraculous lucky cases, as in the story of my parents, the story of how some people survived. I hope that from this presentation, you walk away with a better understanding of the Holocaust being a personal experience and how its impact and how it impacts people itself. Throughout my presentation, all my slides will have a timeline across the top and we will follow the timeline. Um, we'll start in 1937. And why we start in 1937 is a few reasons. First of all, it was five and a half years since the Great Depression in Europe was over. Um, the economy was beginning to bounce back. Um, people's lives were becoming uh, better. Uh, lives were bouncing back. People were beginning to live happy and fulfilled lives. Um, another reason that I started 1937 happens to be some of the earliest pictures I have of my parents. On the left, you see my mother circled in yellow. She's 17 years old. She's studying bookkeeping in high school. And here she is with a bunch of her high school friends at a swimming party. Um, her father, shown here in the middle, uh, he is actually the manager of the local railroad station. And soon he'll be opening up a successful grocery store in Low Poland. They lived in Low Poland at the time. Um, th they were happy, uh, successful, fulfilled, middle-class people. On the right is my father's family, the Zacks family. You see my father circled in yellow here. Um, he is 18 years old in 1937. Um, uh, sitting below him is uh, his father, my uh, paternal grandfather, uh, his 
Polish name is Herschlig Zaks, but he's mostly known as, by his Yiddish name, Gershon Zaks, who I am named after. Uh, my father and his father own a butcher business in Bendine, Poland, and again, very successful and doing well. Um, the gentleman all the way on the right is my uncle Shia. Uh, he's one year older than my father, and he also survived the war. Is my grandmother and a younger uncle Shlomik who were all lost in the war, and we'll go into those details in a little while. But again, I want to re-emphasize that at 17 and 18 years old, uh, they had their lives in front of them. They were happy. Uh, my mother was about to graduate with a bookkeeping degree. My father was running a successful butcher business with his father. In fact, uh, through, through my research, I found that my grandfather, Gershon Zaks, was a leader of the Butchers Artisan Guild in Bendine in 1937. So he was a pretty well-known and pretty successful guy. Of course, everybody knew about Germany and they probably knew about Hitler, but the war was still two years away, right? Before uh, Germany would invade Poland and start World War II. This was another world to them. They never thought this would happen. They never thought that this would impact their lives. Uh, they were looking forward to a long and happy life. We'll jump ahead two years to September of 1939. My mother is now 19 years old. She's graduated high school as a bookkeeper and she's working in a local factory. Um, I want you to think back at what it would be like for you to be, or think forward to what it would be like for you to be 19 years old, uh, working in the local factory. And the factory actually was only a few blocks away from uh, her father's grocery store which was also just a few blocks away from their home. So, one, so on a regular basis, my mother would leave work um, uh, at noon, pick up her mother at the grocery store where her mother worked, and they'd walk home together to have lunch together every day. So think of yourself at 19 years old, and I want you to listen to my mother's explanation of what happened one Friday afternoon. I used to work very close to the house. And it was a half a block to our store. So I used to go to the store, and my mother used to take me home, and we had lunch. And then on Friday, the 1st of September, 39, I was walking home with my mother. And all of a sudden, we saw planes, and the planes were throwing things down. And I said to my mother, I said, Ma, they are bombs. And she says, you're crazy. They're making this uh, only uh, exercise. I put the two of them together and I said, there must be war. And the bombings were insane. So it's interesting that as I'm doing the transcript and listening to my mother's audio, she rattles off this date of Friday, September 1st, right off the top of her head, clearly a date that she will remember for the rest of her life. And uh, as I'm doing the transcript and I'm doing my research, I turned to Google and I Google when did Germany invade Poland? And along with numerous articles and uh, images, I find this, the front page article of the New York Times clearly dated Friday, September 1st. So my mother just remembers this date directly off the top of her head. At the same time, um, I wanna review what happened to my father that first week of September. So my mother was in Low Poland, which is reasonably far from the number of hundred miles from the German border. My father is in Bendine, Poland, which is within walking distance of the border. So on September, so in the first week of September, the Germans actually marched into Bendine. And on September 5th, um, they actually start uh, attacking and burning down the uh, great synagogue of Ben Dean. Um, right before this happens, uh, a number of Jewish people entered the synagogue in order to save the Torahs. And the Germans actually locked them in the synagogue and burned the synagogue down with them in it. Anybody trying to escape through the windows or through the doors was shot. And you can see here on the left, this is an old postcard where you see the Bendine Synagogue circled in red. 
And in the upper left, you can see the Ben Beam Castle up on a hill. Here below it, after the war, you can see the same castle was left untouched, but the entire ruins of the, ben, of the Great Ben Beam Synagogue and the surrounding areas. So in burning down the synagogue, the Germans also been burned down about 50 homes surrounding the synagogues that were inhabited exclusively by Jews. This was actually the synagogue, when, when you hear my father's talk about this, um, you can actually hear how much he loved the synagogue. This is where he and his family actually uh, had uh, uh, um, high holy day services. So here's my father's uh, uh, description of what happened. The order, they came in, the first thing was the kids came in, they went to school. She used to have a school in our town, like a church, something gorgeous to see. We don't see a school like this. So he clearly really loved this, uh, the synagogue. And during this first week in September, the lives of my parents and the lives of the whole world changes. We'll move ahead three years, and during the next three years, from 1939 to 1942, as the Germans um, occupied Poland, things got worse and worse and worse for the Jews under the German occupation. Jews no longer were able to work for the government, and my maternal grandfather in Low Poland lost his job working as the manager of the railway station, which is a railway station, so he had to rely on the grocery store. Businesses and homes were looted and taken away. Uh, registered people, Jews had to be registered, and then later they had to wear yellow uh, Star Davids on the outside of their clothing. Uh, homes were taken away and all Jews were forced to live in ghettos. And uh, most horrifically, uh, pogroms started happening every once in a while, just the citizens of the town, including not just the Germans, but just the citizens of the town would start blaming Jews for the deterioration of, the, of what was going on. And one of the most infamous pogroms was in Low Poland in 1941, where my mother lived. So I'd like you to listen to her account of the Low pogrom. When something like this goes out, the first thing, the Jews get hit. So my father lost the job because he wasn't Jewish. Anytime any the big deal goes on, the Jews right away, there is a pogrom, they start killing them. They used to go in the street and put, uh, they could take a, a cane and put on the end of it a razor blade and chop chop. Across the street, one of our neighbors, the boy, was killed. So did they cause any trouble for your parents' grocery store? Yes. Eventually, he had to move out of there. They were throwing rocks at the windows. That's what I was uh, the, the Polish could say, oh, my son shouldn't see that I'm bodied by you because you're not supposed to buy my Jews. So things got worse and worse and worse. These are all pictures of the low program here. Um, Towards the end of 1942 now, my mother is now 22 years old and she actually has a fiance. She's engaged to be married. Her fiance's family lives in Germany itself and he runs a, uh, um, a trucking business bringing supplies back and forth between Germany and Poland. And as things get worse and worse, my mother's parents sit her down and tell her that she has to leave because uh, it's going to get terrible in, in low Poland. And they tell her that she should leave with her fiance and move to, with her fiance into Germany with her fiance's parents. So they start arranging this and uh, she's basically going to leave her parents uh, in the midst of all of this crisis. And what I'd like you to do is listen to my mother's description of her leaving her parents. Now think of yourself at the age of 22 years old when you have to endure something like this. In that town belonged to Germany, Germany. So it was very quiet there. And the family said, well, come here. So he, he made out that for $4,000, they're gonna take four people. It was him, me, and two of his friends so I said to my mother, how can I leave you under those circumstances here? My mother said to me, you 
You ain't young, and you have a life in front of you. And I lived through one war, and through two wars, nobody knew me. And I didn't want to leave her, and she says, you have to leave me. If you have a choice and a chance, you do it. I will never forget that I was on the truck and through the life, through the thing, I saw my father, I couldn't say goodbye to him. You know, through the war, we always thought maybe life will come back the same day. But mm. as I was going out of the city, I looked through the holes of the truck and I figured to myself, I'm never going to walk those, those streets again. So she knew at that time that she was never going to walk those streets again, and she was right. She was never able to return to Low Poland. And again, I want to reemphasize, think of what it would be like for you to be 22 years old. Your parents arrange for you to leave the town and literally be smuggled out. The arrangements, you don't know when they're going to happen. So any one night, the truck is ready and you have to leave. You, you don't have time to pack. And you literally do not even have time to say goodbye. She gets in the back of the truck and looks through the cracks and the openings of the truck and she sees her father on the street, but there are SS guards on the street and she cannot even say goodbye to her father. And as the truck drives away with her looking out the back, she realizes that she's never going to see her father again and she can't say goodbye to him. And it's interesting how her mother told her how she, her mother, lived through one war, meaning World War I, and she knew herself that she would never be able to survive a second war. So she leaves and she meets up with her fiance and they start heading off to Germany. And on the way to Germany, they stop in Krakow, Poland, where the fiance's brother lives. And they stay with the fiance's brother for a few weeks. And um, there is actually a um, selection process where they get separated. And I'll go into more about that uh, later. So at the same time in 1942, my father is now 23, 24 during these years. From 1942 and through 1944, Back in Bendin, Poland, the Germans assigned this person, Alfred Rosner, to go to work in Bendin, Poland, and organize the textile factories. Bendin was already a very big textile manufacturing hub. Um, many little factories, uh, countless little tailor shops working out of private homes. So the Germans hire this gentleman, Alfred Rosner. He is a German. He is not a Jew. And uh, he is not a Nazi. But he is uh, moved into Bending, Poland to organize and manage the manufacture of German uniforms. All the tailor shops in Bending, Poland get turned over to manufacture German uniforms. If you worked in one of these tailor shops, if you worked in one of these factories, you were issued a Rosner work card, which is shown here in the lower right. And when you had a Rosner work card, you could be assured you carry it with you 100% of the time. When you're on the streets of Bending, Poland, at any time a German officer can stop you and can either question you or just deport you instantly. But if you have this Rosner work card, you show it to them and it shows that you, that you you are important to the German war effort, right? And that you cannot be deported because you work in these tailor shops. So during these years from 1942 through 1944, there were numerous selection processes throughout Bendin. And a selection process is when they gather uh, literally hundreds, if not thousands of people into a local stadium. And in Bendin, it was this Hakoch Stadium. And this is a layout of it that I found. And everybody would be lined up and would be gathered on one end of the stadium. And a single line would be formed to the center circle where a few Nazi officers would look at you for about two seconds and decide if you were to be freed or if you should go to field two because you were young and healthy and you should be sent to a labor camp, or if you were worthless and you should be sent to field three and be deported to Auschwitz and be put to death. 
So these selection processes happened on a regular basis between 1942 and 1944 in Bending, Poland. And my father and his family would go to this site and would go on this line, but my father actually bribed a Rosner manager and purchased uh, four Rosner work cards. So as I mentioned, my father and uh, his father, they were butchers. Uh, it's almost laughable to think of my father being a tailor, right? Um, <clears throat> he knew nothing about tailoring. No one in the family did. But they purchased these Rosner work cards on the black market. So during each one of these selections, they would show the Rosner work card and they would be sent to the field one to be free. I'd like to continue by you hearing my father and mother explain exactly what it was like to go through this selection process. They took me, my brother, the younger one, and they took my mama and my dad. We all one thing. Explain it to them the selection was. Yeah. They used to take Jews and go to the, from door to door, or they said, all the Jews tomorrow have to be in this and this place. And usually they took either a football field, a basketball field, you know, some place that you could accommodate like like uh, 5,000 people or what. And they stood there and they selected people. They put you, one person here, one person here, one person here, one person here. And you didn't know better how you were going. After a few of them, you had already the know-how what was going on. If some a woman would leave a child standing next to her, or just leave it, they could take this woman and put her chances would be that they would put her into a labor camp if she would be young and healthy woman. If she would be with a child on her hand, they put her in a different place and she would go to Auschwitz. If they saw men that they were young and healthy looking, they were putting them in one place. And then the, they were one, two, three, four. One was to Auschwitz, two was to the camp, three was to death, you know, that way. So, as I mentioned, my father's family actually escaped actually being selected and sent to labor camps or Auschwitz for about two years. But over time, especially towards the end of the war and between 44 and 45, uh, more and more towns were declared to be Judenreich which means free of all Jews. And in April of 1944, Ben Dean was ordered to be Judenrein. So every single Jew was to be deported out of Ben Dean and there would be literally no Jews left in Ben Dean at all. Um, so there was a final selection in April of 44. My family went there confident with their Rosna work cards and they got online and they showed their Rosna work cards and they were simply taken away and ripped up. And um, they, the selection process separated my, uh, my father's family. Uh, before I continue, I wanna go on a little tangent and let you know that this Alfred Rosner who managed all of these uh, uh, textile factories, he, as I mentioned, he was not a Nazi. He was a German, but not a Nazi. And he actually knew what was going on. He knew that these Rosner work cards were being uh, purchased and he supported that effort. And in 1944, uh, the Nazis found out about this and they arrested Alfred Rosner and they put him in prison. And he actually died later that year in 1944 in prison. Um, he is now uh, uh, determined to be righteous among nations by Yad Vashem of uh, the uh, Holocaust Museum in Israel. So he is a very good person and uh, saved many, many Jews. So the selection process has occurred and my father's family is now separated. My grandparents, uh, Gitla and Herschleg, and the youngest uncle, Shlamik, uh, they're sent to Auschwitz. My grandmother, not having any specific skills of her own, other than you know the, the honor of just being a, a housewife, um, she is immediately sent to the gas chamber off the train and uh, is cremated in his murder, um, not having any use. Uh, my grandfather, being a butcher, is put to work in the kitchen. 
And Shlomik, who is studying accounting in high school, is put to work in an office nearby. And they survive like this for a while. In the meantime, as a butcher, as uh, working in the kitchen, my grandfather, the story has it, that one day he was uh, in charge of cutting the, uh, the meat that was being given out. And uh, by meat, uh, the story goes is that it was salami. Uh, uh, he was in charge of cutting salami for each of the prisoners. They lined up and as they passed them, he would cut them a piece of salami. Um, and on that line, he recognized a friend of his from Ben Dean, uh, someone that he knew, someone he was friends with. And when his friend came up to be his turn, my grandfather cut a larger piece of salami for him. And a guard saw him cut that larger piece of salami and beat him on the head. And my grandfather fell down and cut his head open. He went to uh, the hospital, the infirmary. And uh, the next morning he was selected to be uh, murdered. Uh, there was no use to try and heal him and wait for him to recover. So he was sent the next morning to the gas chambers and to be murdered. And Shlamik, who was working in an office nearby, actually saw what was going on or he heard what was going on, but he actually went along with my, um, his father, my grandfather, to his death because he didn't want the grandfather to die alone. We actually know this story because the person, the friend that my grandfather cut the larger piece of meat for actually survived Auschwitz and handed down that story. So that's how we know how that happened. On the side, I wanna mention that these pictures that you see are of Birkenau, Auschwitz too. This is where my grandparents died. Um, it also happens to be where my aunt Lily um, survived working in a factory as slave labor. And um, I took these pictures myself when I toured Poland and Germany back in uh, October, November of 2019. My wife and I took this big tour. I visited all of the concentration camps that my father was in and the death marches. And I visited the town that he grew up in, Ben Bean, Poland. And the reason I bring this up is um, no matter how many stories you hear, and no matter how many pictures you see, nothing prepares you for how overwhelming the immensity of Birkenau is. Um, these pictures, like this one on the bottom here, this foundation is actually the foundation of a barracks that held somewhere around 300 people. Each one of these barracks had one smokestack for heat. And you can see uh, these pictures go off in three or four different directions. And you can see here on the left, these smokestacks go on and on and on and on off into the distance to the trees. Here is another direction where they go on and on. You can see the size of Birkenau is enormous. Um, and the size of each of the four crematoriums is enormous. Um, it is an overwhelming experience to actually be there. Well, one of the things I ask people to, to try and give them a, an impression of this is I, everybody kind of knows how big a football field is. Uh, not a lot of people know acres, but they know a football field. So I ask people, how big do you think uh, uh, Birkenau could be, Auschwitz II? Um, and I get answers of 10 football fields. I get answers of 50 football fields. And the largest number I ever got was somebody said that it's probably more like 75 football fields big. Well, let me tell you, Auschwitz Birkenau, just Birkenau, is over 357 football fields big. 357 football fields can fit inside this killing machine. And this is all this thing was, is people to come and to be, um, and to be murdered um, or to be put in slave labor, but most murdered. Um, it is just an overwhelming experience. During that same separation, uh, the selection process, I mean, my father, who is now about 25 years old, and his older brother, um, Shia, who's uh, one year older, 26 years old, 
Uh, they're strong. They're young. My father, remember, is a butcher, so he's handling halves of cows. He's strong. He's healthy. So they don't get sent to Auschwitz. They get sent to a labor camp called Blechheimer, which happens to be a subcamp of Auschwitz. It's about 30 miles away from Bendin, Poland. And because it's so close, they don't get transported there in those famous cattle cars that you've seen and those box cars. They actually get sent in an open passenger car, a normal passenger train. And Shia actually sneaks aboard a bottle of liquor and gets one of the guards drunk on the trip. And at one point, Shia and, uh, jumps off. Shia is this uh, gentleman in the middle here, this picture. He jumps off the train with a few other people. And he lives out the rest of the war with this false identity card, um, acting as if he's not a Jew. He changes, his, he has a false uh, name, uh, a Polish name that he comes up with. And uh, we've heard stories of how he would never have a drink of liquor in public for fear of losing his senses and starting to speak uh, Yiddish or Hebrew. And, and giving away his cover. But he lived um, as a non-Jew and actually did some work for the Polish underground during those years. My father had the opportunity to jump off the train, but they were he was on the train with a number of friends as well as a number of female uh, family members. And he felt that he was going to stay on the train to try and help them survive. So he stayed on the train and got separated from his older brother and continued on to Blechheimer. In Blechheimer, he was tattooed with the number 179085. You can see I found an old picture of him and in a short sleeve shirt, I scanned that into my computer and I actually, uh, um, I actually blew it up and you could actually see the tattoo reading 179085. And the story is, is that my father spent 10 months in Blechheimer uh, working on repairing railroad tracks. Right behind these trees that you see here is a huge railroad yard. So he was doing slave labor, doing heavy labor, fixing railroad uh, tracks for 10 months. And at the end of those 10 months, in the end of, uh, uh, towards the middle of 1944, the Russian army is approaching from the east. And Blechheimer is pretty far to the east, uh, comparatively speaking. So Blechheimer is now um, um, evacuated and everybody in Blechheimer is moved on a death march to Gross Rosen, another concentration camp further to the west uh, inside Poland. So my father goes on the first of three death marches. So for those of you who don't know what a death march is, it's a forced march of the prisoners in a concentration camp to move them from concentration camp to concentration camp towards the end of the war. Uh, they would never spend the uh, resources to use buses or trains for anything like this. So, and they also, a side effect was to starve them and to dehydrate them and to kill as many of them in route as possible. If you were not able to keep up pace, uh, you were shot. If you fell and stumbled and couldn't get up in order to continue the march, you were shot and left where you lay uh, on the road. Um, injuries along the way were neglected. Uh, there, was, there was a lot of humiliation and abuse and torture along the way, and people were just left on the roadside to die. So this is an actual view of what a death march is, and this is how people were dressed on the death march that my father was on. So he is now going to go on the first death march. He's leaving Blechheimer here, shown, shown here, and he's marching to Gross Rosen. Uh, Blechheimer is evacuated on January 21st, 1945, and it is in the dead of winter. The average temperature in January in this part of Germany, in this part of Poland, I mean, is about 30, 32 degrees, according to the statistics. And in my research, I actually found all of the towns that this death march marched through. So back in my tour in October, November of 2019, I actually rented a car. I drove to Blackheimer. I toured Blackheimer. 
And I actually drove the death march from town to town, going through each one of these towns that I know the death march passed through in order to get to Gross Rosen and then tour Gross Rosen. On this death march, the people from Blechheimer, there were about 4,000 prisoners from Blechheimer, and they were joined by about 6,000 other prisoners from other neighboring concentration and labor camps. So there were a total of 10,000 prisoners marching on this death march to Gross Rosen. There were 800 people uh, murdered en route during this death march, and the death march was 120, 127 miles, and it lasted 12 days. And one of the things that really was pretty powerful for me is, uh, this is one example, this is the town center of Yukalazi, which is this town right here, right? And I can't help but wonder what it was like for my father to walk through this town square. Did it look this pretty? Was it this pristine? Was it this nice? What did the townspeople think when they saw 10,000 men dressed like this march through their town? Also the road between Yukalazi and Niza, it's, a, it's almost a straight line between these two towns. It's all farmland. This is the area here in this upper, in this picture in the upper right that we were driving on. So do I know that my father actually walked along this road? No, I certainly can't be 100% sure. But between, in order to get from Yukalazi to Nizer, he either walked on this road or a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right along with 10,000 other men. So it was a pretty powerful experience to actually drive this death march. He arrives at Gross Rosen on February 2nd. Um, again, Gross Rosen is really huge. These are the foundations of the barracks. Um, this is the entrance that was built from the quarry that's over this hill. And he arrives at Gross Rosen. And we find out through research that everybody on this death march that arrived at Gross Rosen only stayed at the Gross, Gross Rosen for seven days when again, the Russian army is approaching from the east and everybody in Gross Rosen is now transferred for a much further distance. And they're now placed in these boxcars, these closed airtight boxcars box um, used for cattle and storage. And they get transferred to Buchenwald. Um, so one of the things that I'm doing is between all this research, I find that he arrived in Gross Rosen on February 2nd and only stayed there seven days which kind of means that he must have left Gross Rosen and gone to Buchenwald on February 9th. Well, through my research, I was able to find dozens and dozens of different documents. And here are two of them. The one on the right, this yellow one on the right, is actually one of the more amazing documents I found. This is my father's transfer document from Gross Rosen to Buchenwald. And remember we said that if he arrived on February 2nd and stayed only seven days, he must have left Gross Rosen on February 9th. Well, here is the stamp at the concentration camp saying that he left Gro concentration camp Gross Rosen on February 9th, 45, and he arrived in concentration camp Buchenwald on February 9th, 45. Right here, you can see those dates. You can see my father's name, his birthday, this is his Auschwitz number given to him in Blechheimer. Remember, Blechheimer is a subcamp of Auschwitz. This is what he has tattooed on his arm. And one of the things I learn is whenever, uh, I actually learned this by writing to Gross Rosen Archives. And they wrote me back saying that in many cases, when a prisoner was transferred from one camp to another, he many times would get a new uh, uh, prisoner number. So this is actually his new number in Buchenwald. This document also says that he's from Benzenberg, which is German for Bendine. It actually has his street address in Bendine. Beruf is profession and his profession was uh, a butcher. Fleischer is German for butcher. Again, one of the amazing things about this document is this field is name of parents. This is the first and only time I ever found documentation about my grandparents. It says that Hirsch, Herschel exacts, uh, his father was also a busher, Fleischer, 
and that his mother was Fried Lezak's. Her maiden name was Yakubovich, and that they are in concentration camp Birkenau, which reinforces other parts of the story that I heard. And also is amazing because my father actually signed this card. I can recognize his signature to this day. Totally independently, I also find this document. So they arrive in Buchenwald on February 9th. This document dated February 21st, and this title in German, when you translate it, it says it's an addendum to the change report of February 10th, the day after they arrive. So this is an addendum done 11 days later. And this list includes 2,460 new additions from concentration cramp Gross Rosen. And on page two, you can see these numbers, one, two, four, five, and then you go down the list and you see six, zero, one, two, four, five, six, zero is my father's name, Saul Joseph Zacks. So here's more proof that he is in Buchenwald. He arrived on this date and this number one, two, four, five, six, zero on this document matches the number in the upper right-hand corner of this document. So all these pieces fit together. He's now in Buchenwald for just a few weeks, seven and a half weeks. And now the allied forces are approaching from the north. So Buchenwald is now evacuated and my father is transferred again and goes on the second of his third death marches. Buchenwald is evacuated on April 2nd and he and every single person in Buchenwald who can walk is now placed on a death march south 220 miles to go to Dachau because the allied forces are approaching from the north here. This death march, if you thought 10,000 people were a lot during that first death march, this death march, everybody in Buchenwald is now accompanied by 28,000 prisoners are marching through the countryside of Germany going to da south to Dachau. Of those 28,000 prisoners, a third of them are murdered en route. 9,000 souls are lost on this death march and my father still survived. This death march is 220 miles. And as they left Buchenwald on April 2nd, Buchenwald is actually liberated by the allied forces only seven days later, I'm sorry, nine days later. Um, so after days of travel, very little water and food, all the prisoners, 28,000 of them now start arriving at Dachau. So now it's April of 1945 and my father arrives at Dachau. And these again are pictures that I took of Dachau when I, arrived, when I toured there. Um, as I mentioned before, there were a number of times when this was a pretty meaningful and powerful experience for me. This was one of the places where I kind of broke down, to be honest. Um, when you tour Dachau, even today, you see these posts and the barbed wire, they're all intact. All of Dachau is completely surrounded by these barbed wire. The uh, only way in and out of Dachau is this building shown here on the left and this entranceway. And you can see by the size of the people that this entranceway is what, maybe 15 feet wide. And this walkway here is maybe 25 feet wide. And this is the only way into Dachau. So as I'm standing on this cobblestone pathway, taking this picture, it uh, really occurs to me that I am within feet of where my father marched into Dachau at the end of this uh, second death march. So he's now in Dachau, he's there for a few weeks. It's very poor sanitary conditions. Uh, Dachau at this time now has about four to five times the number of people that it was ever um, uh, planned to hold. So there are very, there's insufficient provisions. Everybody uh, is sick. There's a very serious typhus epidemic going on in Dachau. So now, um, as the Allied forces continue south, they're approaching Dachau and Dachau is now evacuated on April 26th, um, just a few weeks later. And my father is placed on the third of his three death marches. He is simply sent further south into Germany from Dachau. Um, I found a lot of information on the internet. I found this picture 
of the death march out of Dachau before I went on my trip. This is documented as being taken in a town called Percher, Germany on April 28th. But it was actually in Dachau itself where there is a museum. Dachau has its own museum where my wife found this picture. There was a, there was a uh, exhibit and she actually starts screaming out my name for me to come over. And this, uh, this map here is actually a picture I took of an exhibit in the Dachau Museum right through the glass. And uh, it is the first time I found the path of the death march out of Dachau to Tigansli, uh, which is the last death march that my father went on. And you can actually see that it left on the 26th. And this picture was taken the 28th in Percha, Germany. And you can see the death march actually goes through Percha. So I know, I'm realistic enough to know that the probability is incredibly small. Out of these 15 or 18 people in this picture, what's the probability that my father is in there? But the fact is, is that it's not impossible. And if he's not actually in this picture, uh, he's on this death march with 7,000 other people in the rain on this death march. This death march, as I mentioned, is 7,000 people. Again, 1,000 of them are murdered en route. And he marches about 70 miles towards Tegansley. Um, when he wakes up uh, during the march, people sleep in barns or they just simply sleep out in the open during the, during the evenings. And one day my father wakes up with his friend. He has a friend that he's been with through all these concentration camps, a gentleman by the name of Victor Blumenstick. Um, and they actually wake up with everybody else on the death march and the Germans are gone and the allied forces are approaching. Um, actually, when they left Dachau on April 26th, Dachau was liberated literally three days later. So if he was in Dachau just three days more, he would have been liberated. But he actually is on this death march for a little over a week when um, he is liberated on May 2nd on the death march itself when he wakes up and the German guards are gone. So my father is now liberated and he's in the middle of Germany and he has to start trying to get his life back together again. In the meantime, let's review what's been going on with my mother, right? Back in 1942, we talked about the fact that she left low Poland and she uh, left her parents, her parents told her to leave. She went with her fiance to Krakow to the fiance's brother. When, there was a, when they were there before they ever got to Germany and the fiance's family, there was a selection process. And the um, fiance was an engineer and he was forced to join a traveling group of prisoners that went around the countryside fixing bridges and roads and gates and di different jobs, different odd, you know, uh, uh, handyman type jobs around the countryside with a number of other men. So they're separated and my mother is actually sent, believe it or not, to Blechheimer, the same concentration camp uh, that my father was in. Uh, learning about Blechheimer, there was actually a separate woman's camp within the camp. And I've got documentation here from the International Tracing Service showing that her first camp was Blechheimer and her last camp was Bergen-Belsen. I do not think that, I've found nothing to imply that she was in Blechheimer at the same time that my father was, but it is an amazing coincidence that she was in the same camp. From Blechheimer, she is transferred to Mulhausen Martha II. Um, in the audio transcripts, my mother goes into a lot of detail of how she worked for quite a while as slave labor in an old watch and clock factory working under Werner von Braun working on rockets that were hitting England, that were being shot at England. Um, many of you may know the name Werner von Braun. He was a famous Russian uh, rocket scientist, um, best known for the V2 rocket. And um, he, was, uh, uh, he emigrated to the United States after the war and worked for the US government. And he was responsible for the Saturn V rocket, which got us to the moon. But early on in his career, he worked on a series of test rockets during his experimentations phases, the A1 through A3 rockets, 
which is what my mother worked on in this X clock and watch factory in Martha II. When the experiments were finished with the A3 rocket and Werner von Braun was ready to move on to develop the V2 rocket in Punamunda, they closed that factory and they evacuated the Martha II um, labor camp. And my mother was then transferred to Bergen-Belsen. Um, here she worked in the kitchen. Here are some barracks, which you'll hear her describe. And I'd like you to listen to my mother's um, uh, description of life inside Bergen-Belsen right towards the end of the war. At that point, our food was impossible. We had bread that was green inside. And uh, we had soup made out of the stuff that you give cows to eat. We were living at that point in a factory building that each room had about 120 women, three uh, stacks up, you know, the, the, the rock beds, straw inside and very wooden, and that's it. Some of the Czechoslovakian told the girls that it's going to be very close, that, we're gonna, that, the, that the Germans will get out. So I organized the whole kitchen and we ripped apart a couple of beds. And we had knives and hammers and choppers. We were watching the Germans, that we were afraid that they were going to do us harm before they will run away. Mm -hmm. So we were watching them, we were prepared to fight. So again, I want to you know, review that early on when she was leaving her parents, she talked about the concept that, you know, you just get along, you do what you have to do. And they always had the hope that life would return and life would get back to normal. By this time, they realized that's not gonna happen. They realized the hell that they've survived so far. And towards the end, when they realized that, uh, you know, the, these Czechoslovakians had uh, information, that the Russians were gonna be coming and the Allies were gonna be coming and that the Germans were gonna be leaving soon and they would just abandon them, which is what they did. But they were afraid that the Germans would murder them right towards the end as, as a last resort, as the last thing they did. So my mother actually organized the kitchen and got knives and choppers and handed them out to the women in her barracks to defend themselves and to fight. They were ready to not take this anymore. But the Germans just left and they were liberated by allied forces in the middle of April 45. So now it's April of 1945 and my mother's in Bergen-Belsen liberated. My father is in the middle of Germany outside, uh, a little south of Dachau liberated. And they're going around the countryside trying to figure out how to get their lives back together again. My mother works her way back to Krakow. Krakow was the last time she knew where her fiance was. And remember, they just went through a separation, a selection process. So she was hoping that the fiance would return to Krakow and she would find him. When she returns to Krakow, she meets some friends of his and she finds out the story of what happened. Uh, the fiance was, as I mentioned, traveling the countryside with a bunch of other people doing repairs and during the evenings, they would sleep either outside or they would sleep in barns. And one night, and every once in a while, actually, when they were sleeping in barns, somebody would try to escape by digging underneath the hay in the barns and hiding there. And the next morning, they'd gather up the people and they'd, keep, they'd start marching to the next place to do some work. And people would escape this way. Well, one night her fiance tried to escape that way and hid under the hay. But on that same night, the story goes that about 20 other men decided to do it on that same night. So when they gathered up the people the next morning, it was clear that a lot of people were missing. So they searched the barn. And once they searched the barn, it was easy to find them. And they were immediately shot on site for trying to escape. So she learns in Krakow that her fiance has been murdered and she's lost her fiance. So she's lost her fiance, she's lost her parents, she's in the middle of Krakow where she doesn't know anyone, um, uh, where, where she doesn't have any family, I mean, and um, she's devastated and, and she's basically a wreck with no money and no prospects and, and few friends. 
Uh, the only friends that she has are a few people that she got liberated from uh, out of Bergen Belsen and they, you know, went, they went around together. My father, in the meantime, is working his way north to uh, Bergen, the town of Bergen, which is right outside Bergen Belsen, because he heard that there was a large displaced persons camp there that was trying to help people um, uh, find their families and that he would be able to get some food and he'd be able to survive there. So him and his friend Victor were working their way up north. And one night, um, Victor is not feeling well. He's either sick with the flu, he has a temperature, he's not doing well at all. It's very late at night and they find a farm. They knock on the farmhouse door to try and get a place to stay. The farmer says, you can't come in the house but there's a whole bunch of refugees in my barn. You're welcome to stay in the barn. So he goes to the barn, knocks on the door. Somebody comes to the door, asks to be let in. And the guy in the barn says, sorry, there's no room. We're full up. There's too many people. You, we, we can't let you in. You have to find another place. My father starts yelling, uh, you can't do that. My friend Victor here is sick. He needs a place to stay. He needs a place to rest. You have to let us in. And he's yelling. When all of a sudden my father hears someone from inside the barn, another place in the barn, someone clearly in charge of the barn, yells, slam the door on them, throw them out. They're disturbing everybody because it's late at night. They're disturbing everybody, just get rid of them. Well, my father goes a little bit nuts. He bursts in past the guy and he finds the guy that yelled this to throw them out, that yelled at them to throw them out not because he was angry with that guy, but because he recognized the voice. And the guy that yelled at them to throw my father out was his brother who jumped off the train a year earlier. And that is how my father and his brother reunited, is that he was in charge of that barn, uh, working with that Polish underground. And um, my father, just randomly found that barn and recognized his brother's voice and they got together. So they together went up to Bergen-Belsen and they were together ever since. And they uh, finally settled in Stuttgart and they started trying to build a life in Stuttgart, in, the, in Stuttgart, Germany. In the meantime, my mother, as I mentioned, still had some friends from Bergen-Belsen. And these friends got contacted that a friend of theirs is going to be married and that they have to go attend this wedding. And they, assent, they insisted that my mother go along with them, even though my mother didn't know the people that were getting married, they insisted on dragging my mother along to attend this wedding simply because they didn't wanna leave her alone and they wanted to get her out of her mood. They wanted her to try and start cheering her up. So they take her to a wedding in Stuttgart, Germany. And of course you can guess, my mother and my father meet at this wedding in Stuttgart, Germany. They get married in April of 1946 and they settle in Stuttgart. My brother is born in January of 47, my older brother. They live in Stuttgart, Germany, trying to rebuild their lives. And they spend two years applying for war reparations, which are never granted. I have dozens and dozens of paperwork, of, of documents, of paperwork, of my parents applying for war reparations and an equivalent number of documents denying them anything. And they were also applying to emigrate to the United States. And finally, in 1949, they emigrate to the United States. And uh, below on the bottom here is the ship manifest showing my father, my mother, and my older brother, whose name was Israel. Um, Jews, male, female, their birthdays, their occupations. Um, to be honest, why in heaven's name they were aiming to go to Omaha, Nebraska, I don't know. I know they wound up in the Bronx in New York and actually moved to Queens a little after that. And I grew up in Queens. So there we are. They've been liberated. They've survived concentration camps. Their new families are being formed. In the meantime, I'll say that I mentioned that my aunt Lily was also in Auschwitz working as, uh, uh, working as slave labor. And Uncle Shia, he was the one that jumped off the train and lived as a non-Jew, hid himself as a non-Jew. And Lily made her way back to Bendin, Poland, 
and found some people who heard that Shia was alive in Stuttgart and or in, or I think it was Bergen Belsen at that point. And they sent out some people to go get him and he returned to Bendin and they were reunited. They were actually married before the war started. So they get reunited. Shia and Lily move, uh, emigrate to the United States and live in Patterson. My father and mother moved to the Bronx and then shortly afterward moved to Queens. And they start their new lives and they start building their families. Um, this is me at my bar mitzvah and my older brother. Um, Lily and Shia have two sons, Alan and Jerry. You actually may have heard of Jerry Zaks. He's a four-time Tony Award-winning director who did uh, Hello, Dolly and uh, Guys and Dolls. Um, between the four of us, there are nine grandchildren. I'll put a plug in for my two angels over here. This is my daughter, Cheryl, graduating with her doctorate degree in political science from Berkeley. My younger daughter, Michelle, is a speech pathologist graduate, who graduated from New York Medical College. And between them, there are now 11 great grandchildren. So the Zacks family grows, the Zacks family survives, and the Nazis' final solution is a failure. What I really wanna leave you with though, is the thought of what happens next. And the idea that what happens next is really up to you and it's up to us, it's up to all of us. A famous poem from a pastor who was also the victim of the Nazis, I'd like to read a couple of stanzas. I won't read the whole thing. This actually is not the entire poem, but it reads, first they came for the Jews and I did not speak out because I wasn't a Jew. And then they came for the communists and I did not speak out because I was not a communist. And it goes on and on until it ends with, and then they came for me. And there was no one left to speak out for me. So I want to make you think. I want you to think of your life and how you want to live your life and the person you want to be. Someday you may hear about Holocaust denial. You may hear slurs against a specific group of people by race or by religion. And I want to ask you, what will you do when you hear that? Will you stand aside like they did in the low program and watch this happen? Or will you rise to the occasion and be another Alfred Rosner who against all odds and against his own safety and in losing his own life did what was morally right to save, the, to save these people? What type of person will you be? Will you recognize the signs of injustice when it happens? And will you never be complacent when you see it? Because complacency is silence and you can never stay silent when you hear and when you witness this hatred. And will you never forget what happened? I wanna close with just this high level overview. These are all of the movements of my parents. My dad is in red and my mother is in purple. Um, this is the town of Lowe, where she grew up, this is the town of Ben Dean, where my father grew up, the concentration camps, Blackheimer, Gross Rosen, Buchenwald, Dachau. Uh, here is Stuttgart, where they uh, settled after the war and took the ship to the Bronx out of, this, uh, out of Bre Bre Bremerhaven. Um, I want to thank everybody for listening. I hope this was enlightening. I hope you walk away with a good message that the Holocaust was not just a mechanical historical thing. It was something that affected people and it will affect people in the future. Uh, this was not the only genocide that has ever happened. There have been some since. I'm afraid to say that there will probably be more in the future. And we have to always be on the lookout for this hate and to stop it wherever we see it. Thank you all very much for listening. Take care.